This program is made possible with support from the Federal Highway Administration, the Kentucky Transportation Cabinet, the Kentucky Heritage Council, and the Kentucky Archaeological Survey. It's definitely a cut block. You can see the squared edges of it as it runs along. On a stormy summer morning, a team of divers and archaeologists are investigating a construction site beneath the Ohio River near Louisville. They're examining an unknown structure found during prior sonar surveys. The pier for a new highway bridge is planned for this site. But first, archaeologist Steve Ayler and Wayna Roach need to determine if the structure hidden beneath the muddy water has any historical significance. It does look like layers have been stacked up here. As you can tell, they're progressively getting higher. The sandstone blocks are remnants of a mill race, the channel to a grain mill located along the riverbank during the mid-1800s. Ayler will prepare a site report for government officials. He does not recommend further investigations. The pier impacts only a small portion of the mill race. Yet, this archaeological research has documented an important piece of history, hidden from view for over 100 years. The historic structure may now be protected from future development. Historic archaeology is a relatively new scientific discipline, but it has led to fascinating discoveries about the early history of the Commonwealth. This era is documented in government records, newspapers, and the accounts of prominent historic figures. But these written records often overlook the lives and perspectives of ordinary people the men and women who built the farms, roads, and cities that transformed Kentucky. Their stories are the primary focus of historic archaeology. Historic archaeology is a way to understand the past. It's a study of people, events, and cultures. It's a social science, a subdiscipline of archaeology, which is itself a subdiscipline of anthropology. We study um, in North America uh, the period after European contact, which would be generally from the 1500s onward. It's a discipline in which we take material culture, especially but not exclusively things we find in the ground, and we combine them with documents and oral history and a variety of data sources to try and understand the past in a more holistic fashion. It's the archaeology of the modern world and how the modern world has developed. It's the archaeology of us. It's telling the story that the history books don't tell. Before 1770, the lands that would become Kentucky contained scattered Native American villages and the encampments of a small number of European hunters, explorers, and surveyors. By 1820, the population of the new Commonwealth had grown to over half a million. During this period, river landings rose into ports. Forts and farmsteads grew into villages. Kentucky itself would become a national crossroads for immigration, commerce, and the westward expansion of the United States. Historic archaeologists are working to better understand this era and the daily lives of the people who established the 15th state of the Union. In 1983, archaeologist Nancy O'Malley launched a major research project into the frontier stations of the inner bluegrass region. During the Revolutionary War, American settlers built hundreds of fortified wooden cabins to defend against British and Indian attacks. Yet, 
In order to study these early settlement sites, O'Malley first had to find them. Archaeological investigation often begins here in the archive. By doing archival research first, you go into the field armed with uh, enough information that you can often recognize what you're seeing and interpret it more accurately than you would if you went in and didn't really know what to expect. There are few traces of frontier stations on the modern landscape. When hostilities ended after 1783, settlers dismantled these crude wooden structures. Families spread out, using the timbers from these stations to build more substantial farmsteads. In time, the location of most frontier stations faded from memory. I eventually compiled a large number of sites that had been called stations by someone at some point. And from there, I started looking at each individual station. Uh, for over 150, that turned out to be a pretty laborious job, maybe a little bit bigger than I had originally anticipated. But it also turned out to be a fascinating journey into the past. O'Malley has conducted excavations at several frontier sites, including Fort Boonesboro. The original site is preserved today in Fort Boonesboro State Park. Established in 1775, Fort Boonesboro was a large defensive structure occupied by several families. The fort protected settlers from British and Indian attacks. After the American Revolution, this large fortification was no longer needed. Prone to floods, Fort Boonesboro was soon abandoned. In 1987, O'Malley conducted excavations to learn more about daily life at this iconic site in Kentucky's history. One of the uh, key things that we found was the remains of a cabin chimney. And then another really key find, which was uh, a great find, was a hearth that was absolutely chock full of domestic and wild animal bone. And when we had the final analysis done, it read like a, a grocery list for Pioneer Diet, uh, bison, cattle, just all kinds of other critters. I think it gives us a bigger picture. Uh, a lot of the, the documentary evidence will mention the key animals like, like white-tailed deer as being a big part of the diet. But we know from this one feature here at Boonesboro that they were eating a wide range of animals. A replica of Fort Boonesboro has been built near the original site. Each year, this popular living history museum attracts thousands of visitors. O'Malley's research has been incorporated into various exhibits, as well as authentic demonstrations about life on America's first western frontier. Archaeologists have documented hundreds of sites dating to the frontier period in Kentucky. Each one has a unique story to tell. In Edmondson County, archaeologists continue to investigate early saltpeter mining in Mammoth Cave. During the War of 1812, Kentucky led the nation in the production of saltpeter, an essential ingredient in gunpowder. This research documents leaching vats, wood pipes, and the hazardous work conducted mostly by slaves. And in Logan County, archaeologists excavated the John Arnold Farmstead, one of the earliest European settlements in southwest Kentucky. This investigation challenged popular notions that the Penny Ryle region was completely isolated and poor during the frontier period. Evidence of imported goods, and a diet rich in both native plants and European crops suggests the Arnold family was well-connected and well-fed. Historical archaeology fills in the gap uh, because it looks at the specific sites where settlers lived. It collects artifacts that they used. Also, I think, too, it, it speaks to 
what people bring with them that they value. And I think in the case, for instance, of Mary McGarry, whose assemblage we have, you know, she obviously brought in some treasured dishes. And it may have just been a few plates and a couple of teacups. They didn't lose sight of what they came here for, and that was to eventually um, begin leading a life that uh, was a little bit more like the one they left behind. The deprivations that they were undergoing in, as, as settlers, uh, they knew were going to be temporary, and they were looking forward, I think. Um, and some of the things they brought with them helped them remember that goal. By 1820, Kentucky had the sixth largest population of the states in America. Most of this population had European ancestry. A quarter of the population was African American slaves. The antebellum era was a time of affluence for some, steady growth for others, and oppression for many. Each year, historic archaeologists discover new insights into how people lived and died during the antebellum. In the year 2000, archaeologists were conducting extensive surveys of the grounds at Ashland, the Henry Clay estate. Led by Kim McBride, the survey team discovered an unknown feature, an old privy vault. As excavations began, McBride realized they had made a monumental discovery. The old privy vault was completely filled with discarded objects. Over a period of three years, Archaeologists carefully excavated fragments from nearly 900 ceramic vessels. The quantity of artifacts from this privy is phenomenal, um, especially in terms of the percentage that we can get back together to refit the different vessels. Most privies have artifacts in them, but this one we felt as we were digging it, sometimes it was almost as much you know, artifacts as dirt. Henry Clay was one of the wealthiest men in Kentucky. After his death in 1852, the original Clay home was demolished. Clay's son built the Italianate house seen today. Sometime during this construction period, ceramics from the original home were thrown down the old privy vault. The privy was then covered and forgotten for over 100 years. Today, McBride's team is analyzing this priceless collection. Each piece is carefully sorted, identified, and refit like a three-dimensional puzzle. The most surprising thing about the privy assemblage has been the variety. We seem to have, you know, vessels of all colors, shapes. Um, functions. We've got lots of porcelain, we've got lots of Chinese porcelain, lots of English porcelain, but then also too lots of locally made ceramics. It's telling us that the Clay family had very um, lovely set tables, probably you know a lot of entertaining um, went on in Ashland, the variety of ceramics, the number of um, well-represented sets of dishes is probably the most varied and likely the most expensive assemblage that I have ever worked on. McBride has also recovered ceramics from the site of Ashland's former slave quarters. By comparing these two collections, she can learn more about daily life on the estate of Henry Clay. This is a, a plate of a shirge from a redware vessel that's from the slave quarters. And our impression is that the slave quarters does have a higher percentage of these coarser wares. Now, is there anywhere in here where it says if it's privy versus slave quarter? We have about 20 matching vessels that are found both in the privy and in slave quarters, which is very interesting. It does show us that there is some sharing of material culture, some probably, we often assume, hand-me-downs of sets that are being discarded from the main house. 
but um, perhaps they're also, you know, making large purchases and buying for the house and the slave quarters at the same time. Well, it's long done. Long done. During the antebellum period, a quarter of a million enslaved African Americans worked throughout Kentucky. Many slaves worked on farms and plantations. One of the state's largest commercial crops was hemp. This long, tough fiber was used in a variety of products, rope, clothing, and bagging for bales of cotton in the Deep South. The cultivation of hemp was hard, dirty work. In Kentucky, slaves did almost all of this back-breaking labor. Archaeologists are gaining insights into the lives of slaves at Farmington Historic Plantation. In 1809, John and Lucy Speed established this farmstead along Beargrass Creek in Jefferson County. By 1840, Farmington was one of the largest hemp plantations in Kentucky. The focus of the research is, first of all, to illuminate what 19th century was like on a hemp plantation. Um, the hemp plantation was successful only because of the large population of enslaved African Americans that worked on the plantation. At, at the height of the operations, at least 57 enslaved African Americans lived and worked at Farmington. Their life is the focus of this work. There are only a few written documents about the slaves who lived at Farmington. One court record lists only their first name, age, and price. In order to fill this void, archaeologists are investigating the remains of buildings preserved on the core grounds. This stone foundation right here was uncovered in uh, 1997 and 1998 by the University of Louisville Field School. And uh, this is a, an outbuilding that was found just on the edge of the main house and the other outbuildings associated with it. Uh, when we did our excavations here, we uh, found a lot of artifacts that uh, we considered to be domestic in nature. And uh, when we looked into the records, we found that the Speed family had written a uh, letter saying that they arrived at the property and they're staying in cabins on the property. So we believe they lived in this cabin while the main house was being constructed. We believe that they converted this building into quarters for their slaves. Today, scholars are working with architects from the University of Cincinnati. The team is using computer graphics to digitally reconstruct Farmington as it looked in 1840. John Speed died that year. The settlement of his estate produced a host of archival documents. Historic plats help define the borders of the original plantation and what buildings existed in 1840. Aerial photos confirm the distance between outbuildings and the main house. Legal records identify the types of crops and livestock, but the exact location of fields and pastures remains speculation. Most of all, artifacts provide clues about the function of each building. Computer animation allows us to take the information we gained from the excavation, the spatial information, and the artifactual information, the glass, the nails, the ceramics, and put them together so that we can actually see or visualize the 19th century. Farmington's slave cabin is also being reconstructed using archaeological research. Field surveys provide dimensions. By today's standards, the cabin was incredibly small, about the size of a modern bedroom. The quantity and type of nails reveal it was a timber structure with clapboard siding and a wood shingle roof. Concentrations of architectural debris mark the location of windows, the door, and what was likely a working porch. Because the cabin is located so close to the core of the plantation, the main house and the main outbuildings, it would probably have been a slave who worked in the main house or had maybe a special skill, a blacksmith, an artisan of some sort, a butcher, someone who had skills that were needed in and around the core of the plantation. 
Inside, archaeologists know the interior had plaster walls from remnants of lime found in the soil. The cabin most likely had a wood floor and an attic loft. Furnishings would have been plain and spare. A storage cellar was discovered during excavations. Artifacts provide clues about cooking utensils, place settings, and some personal items from the family that once lived here. Coins, buttons, a marble, and fragments of a ceramic doll. It would have been a husband and wife, both who worked in the core of the plantation rather than out in the field. And that would have included maybe extended family, children, um, sisters, maybe a grandmother. Between five to 10 people would be living in a cabin about this size. Farmington was at its peak of production when John Speed died. His estate was divided among his wife and children. This included 57 slaves. Some remained on the farm. Most were sold. Their fate is unknown. During the antebellum, an estimated 77,000 slaves from Kentucky were literally sold down the river to plantations in the Deep South. Families were ripped apart. Younger generations were separated from family histories, spiritual beliefs, and traditional culture. Archaeologists are trying to reconnect this cultural fabric at over a dozen historic sites in Kentucky. One site is Riverside, a farmstead located southwest of Louisville along the Ohio River. Archaeology has played a key role in the preservation of this early historic site. Nine to 23 slaves worked at Riverside over the course of three owners. Archaeologist Jay Stotman has recovered artifacts from several features that provide a rare glimpse into the traditions of enslaved African Americans. Some of my favorite artifacts are some of the artifacts that we think are related to the slaves that lived here at Riverside. Uh, take, for instance, we have a spoon handle that has an X scratched on it, or some coins with uh, holes pierced in them. Um, these artifacts, or these types of artifacts, have been found in uh, uh, slave context all throughout the South. Slaves carved an X on a variety of objects. The X is thought to be a religious symbol with origins in the Bakongo cosmology of West Africa. Archaeologists also find pierced coins at slave sites. These coins were often worn as amulets or good luck charms to ward off evil spirits. I think these artifacts are very important because they, they give us some insight into um, the lives of enslaved African Americans uh, here at Riverside as well as uh, in, in the South during the antebellum period in general. Um, it gives us insights to their, to their religion, um, some of the conditions that they lived under, or some of the things that they tried to do um, under the oppression of slavery, because that's an aspect of, of uh, slavery life that maybe we can't get with some of the historical documents. This might have been something that, uh, an aspect of their lives that they tried to keep hidden from the people that owned them. Another source of information about life during the antebellum comes from death. In 2002, construction workers uncovered graves at the site of a new government office complex in Frankfurt. There was no official record of the burial ground, which had been obscured by development during the late 1800s. Over a period of three months, archaeologists excavated about 240 burials dating from 1830 to 1850. The site became known as the Old Frankfurt Cemetery. Each burial was carefully documented and exhumed for laboratory analysis by a team of scientists. 
Physical anthropologists really, we, uh, the main focus is we study human variation and we look at sort of human physiology, human skeletal anatomy, uh, sort of the genetics of that and say, what's sort of the range? Like where did people come from? Uh, what was their health? What was their lifestyle? What kind of things were they doing physically? You know, what kind of work were they doing? To explore these questions, Killarn designed a series of laboratory tests. He started with over 300 measurements of each skeleton. These data told him the gender, age, and stature of each individual. Killarn analyzed bones and teeth for insights into health, diet, and life ways. We have 238 individuals that we can really clearly identify. Um, 92 of them are children. The average age is about 34. Uh, which is sort of typical time period, but we have people living into their 60s. What's surprising about that group is uh, a lot of labor in children. I mean, I'm, I'm getting arthritis in kids that are, you know, in their young ages, uh, really short in stature, which is an indicator of uh, lack of nutrition and sort of bad health, uh, but, but they're still doing a lot of labor, um, and I think things probably were really tough for them. Old Frankfurt Cemetery was the burial ground for a working class neighborhood. The slaves, freemen, and laborers who helped build the capital city. From excavations, researchers learned much about the economic status of this population. Through DNA analysis, the team learned surprising facts about their ethnicity. About 30% were Euro-Americans with genetic ties to Central Europe. About 60% were African Americans. Most had genetic markers suggesting West African ancestry. And about 10% had a mixed heritage. It shows that it's an integrated cemetery. Um, it, we have some people with mixed backgrounds, so people are clearly interacting with each other. But what's interesting about that is, is that um, there are African Americans and people of mixed heritage in the upper cemetery and the lower cemetery. So ethnicity and segregation, which you see later in some of the cemeteries in Kentucky, isn't present. There does seem to be some status dividers there, and, but it seems to be more economic. So there's some really interesting things socially going on here. All of the remains from the old Frankfurt site have been reinterred at nearby Fort Hill Park. Killoran continues to compile the scientific data. To better understand the people, he commissioned forensic artist Rebecca Agner to create a series of facial reconstructions. For the first time, Killoran was able to see the faces behind the statistics from this unprecedented investigation. They're just really stunning people. Uh, and it, all the disease, the pathologies, and, and all this other stuff that you know, I know about these individuals, I still look at them and go like, wow, these are, this is somebody that you can see walking down the street today. It's not just measurements or bones or heights or averages. These are real individuals. And that was something that we thought was really important, to make people aware that they were real people, living real lives that were really interesting and worth knowing about. Archaeologists have documented thousands of sites dating to the antebellum period in Kentucky. Each investigation gives scholars a more complete picture of life during this complex era. In Mercer County, archaeologists have gained insights into Shaker ingenuity at Pleasant Hill. Excavations under the Wash House have revealed a sophisticated water delivery system. Soil stains found at the dye house have shown the colors used in their textile industry. In Fayette County, excavations at Higby Tavern have provided information about the role of roadside taverns. The discovery of numerous sewing artifacts suggests that clothing repair was part of the tavern's customer service. 
The antebellum period as a point of establishment in the economies, the agriculture economy, the commercial economies of Kentucky is a rich period and we're seeing the importance of many different cultures coming together. And certainly we're seeing what many sociologists have called that kind of melting pot phenomena where cultures blend. But we're also seeing the sort of vibrancy and the strength of local cultures persisting amidst you know, that larger blend, especially in our cities, um, such as, say, Louisville, with its, with its large African and German populations, but also in the rural areas, where we have, um, you know, a lot of immigrants coming and clustering in different areas. And by combining the, again, the documents with the material culture, we're getting a better understanding of how these folks came to Kentucky and kind of put together a life using their old cultures, but also making a new. The Civil War changed everything in Kentucky. The Commonwealth, communities, and even families were divided over the core issues of slavery and secession. As a slave state, Kentucky remained with the Union. As a border state, Kentucky became a strategic battleground. This pivotal period is documented in diaries, military records, and newspapers. But some events have been lost in the smoke of war, and some perspectives have never been documented. Archaeologists explore this hallowed landscape, seeking clues about life on both the front lines and the home front. In September of 1862, Confederate forces under Generals Bragg and Smith occupied most of southern Kentucky. An attack on northern cities seemed imminent. Union troops and local militias rushed to bolster defenses around key ports such as Covington, Louisville, and Paducah. These fortifications, combined with overwhelming Union forces, discouraged major Confederate advances. Only a few of these fortifications from the great emergency have survived. One is Battery Hooper in northern Kentucky. We are standing at the site of Battery Hooper. Battery Hooper was one of 28 fortifications built here between 1861 and 1865 by the Union Army during the Civil War. It was a cannon battery, so it was a U-shaped earth fortification built in 1861. Because it was built in 1861, we have found out, it was built more according to military specifications than we had expected. It has a wonderful stone foundation to the gun emplacement itself. The powder magazine has a stone uh, foundation, so we're working on trying to uncover all of those uh, foundation uh, pieces today. Surveys help to verify the materials and dimensions of the fortifications. This data allows archaeologists to compare military plans to the actual evidence in the ground. I've done about six weeks of excavation at another site called Battery Bates. That site was built in 1862 and 1863. It's completely of earth. There's no stonework at all. And what the official records don't tell us is that they use two different construction methods. Those built in 1861 were built to military specifications. They were not in a hurry. At Battery Bates, the other one, there's no stone at all because it was first thrown up or built during the emergency in September of 1862. They were in a hurry. They needed the dirt piled up to hide the cannon behind. So we found some very interesting differences for comparison. The impact of historical archeology span is also evident at Camp Nelson Civil War Heritage Park. Each summer, reenactors gather here to commemorate the camp's unique role during the Civil War. Camp Nelson began as a United States Army supply depot in 1863, and then in 1864 it became the state's largest recruitment and training camp for African American troops who were referred to as U.S. Colored Troops, and also became the state's largest refugee camp for African American women and children, most of whom were uh, 
the wives and children of these enlisting soldiers. Camp Nelson was massive. This sprawling complex of forts, warehouses, and barracks covered over six square miles. After the war, most of the buildings were dismantled, but archaeologists have made numerous discoveries throughout the grounds. I think one aspect of historic archaeology is that just it probably gives more of a perspective from the common soldier while documents give more of a perspective from the officers, the elite of the army. Artifacts show enlisted men had cheaper buttons and dishes and lower quality foods. The bones of rabbit, squirrel, raccoon, and duck were found at the sites of enlisted men. This suggests soldiers supplemented their army rations by hunting wild game. Uh, food ways in particular, what soldiers were eating is an area where archaeology has made a big contribution and see that there's a lot more variability than we might think from understanding the rations that are documented in uh, numerous records. Uh, there was a lot of supplementing the diet through hunting, gathering, collecting, purchasing, robbing, uh, what have you. McBride has also conducted excavations at the site of a Civil War tragedy, the refugee encampment site. The archaeology at the encampment site was directed towards first really understanding the spatial layout of the site and then also the internal organization, perhaps such questions as how many cabins were there, uh, what activities were going on at the cabins. One thing we were really interested in, besides just kind of a general question on day-to-day -day life, was what occupations did the women have? In order to stay, they needed to have some legitimate, necessary, vital employment. And one of the most common, or the two most common employment uh, jobs for women were uh, washerwomen or laundresses and cooks. Nearly 10,000 former slaves enlisted at Camp Nelson alone. In 1864, enlistment for men meant emancipation. But the dependence of black soldiers, their wives, children, and relatives were still considered slaves under state and federal law. With nowhere to go, dependents built shanty towns in and around the military camp. Periodically, Union commanders would drive out those living in the refugee encampments who did not have an official job. We started picking up a lot of buttons, a lot more buttons we had found at any other site, as well as uh, other clothing items like hooks and eyes and uh, a lot of seed beads, the really tiny beads that would be sewn in clothing or purses. And some of these buttons were like officers' buttons and other military buttons. And what these artifacts suggest is uh, these buttons are probably lost from doing laundry. Hello. On a cold week in November 1864, Camp Nelson's commander ordered another ejection of all unemployed personnel. Over 400 refugees, the families of Union soldiers, were loaded onto wagons and dumped along the road to Nicholasville. When they ejected the um, refugees out of the camp, the soldiers were ordered to destroy the camps and burn the shanties or cabins that the, the people had built. Uh, and we actually have pretty obvious archaeological evidence of this burning in the uh, uh, thick ash zones, burned nails, melted glass, um, other burned artifacts. Over the course of the next few days, the temperature dipped below freezing. The refugees had little shelter. About 100 of them died from exposure. Most of the dead were children. This tragedy caused a national uproar. As a direct result, the federal government changed its policy, granting the dependents of black soldiers their freedom. With the aid of missionaries, 
The Union Army built shelters for refugee families at Camp Nelson. In time, over 3,000 African Americans found sanctuary, medical care, and schooling at the Home for Colored Refugees. And it's just such a paradox or contradiction considering what uh, the Civil War was about, particularly after the Emancipation Proclamation was passed, which was over a year before uh, the ejection happened here. But it, it kind of reinforces the sort of uh, paradoxical nature of Kentucky as a Union state but a slave state in the Civil War. Eight regiments of U.S. colored troops were established at Camp Nelson, including the 12th Heavy Artillery. This is a reproduction bronze cannon from the actual Civil War, the 1861 period. The 12th was reactivated in 2003. Today, members provide educational programs to help preserve the memory of those who served and died during the Civil War. And the archaeological work that has been done here helps us to better understand how the refugees lived. Uh, it also helps us to better understand the soldiers and some of the things that they did. And with, without that, you, you certainly you have the military record, but the military record itself does not tell the complete story. You need the archaeological aspect to get a complete story of all the people that were here. Archaeology has been instrumental in efforts to preserve dozens of Civil War sites in Kentucky. Each one speaks to a pivotal chapter in the state's history. Historical archaeology has made numerous contributions uh, in the understanding of the Civil War, particularly by adding the perspective of material culture uh, to the documents, which is the normal way to investigate it. And particularly if you look at it through three different kind of site types, uh, encampments, here archaeology helps better understand the everyday life of common soldiers, what they ate, what kind of supplies they had, what kind of ammunition they had, what their housing looked like. On fortifications, we can look at how what kind of variability there was in the construction of fortifications. Did they follow the engineer's plan or did they make alterations on those? The third type, main type of site, are battlefields, and this is perhaps almost the whole subdiscipline itself and it has different methods. And here we've made contributions in understanding the troop positions and movements, their ammunition, and particularly how that might uh, fit in with the documents, which again are, are provided mostly by officers who have an agenda to describe the battle, but also perhaps to make themselves not look too bad. Uh, the archeology span can provide perhaps a more objective uh, view of what happened during a battle. The Civil War had a profound impact on Kentucky. A quarter of the state's soldiers never returned. Agricultural markets, based on slave labor and southern trade, collapsed. And like all of America, Kentucky struggled with Reconstruction and civil rights. Yet Kentucky's cities were largely spared the ravages of war. These growing manufacturing centers attracted a population on the move. The first generation of freed slaves, the sons and daughters of farmers, and a new wave of European immigrants. After the war, Kentucky would enter the age of industrialization with a full head of steam. Industrialization had a huge impact on port communities throughout Kentucky. This is illustrated at a 55-acre site along the Ohio River known as Portland Wharf Park. Over the past six years, archaeologist Jay Stotman has been working here to learn how this river community changed over time. During the mid-1800s, Portland Wharf flourished as a major commercial port on par with the landings at Louisville. Today, all vestiges of this river heritage are buried beneath the ground. 
The archaeology in Portland Wharf Park has been well preserved. Uh, it's, it's been buried beneath feet of silt from, from floods and um, development of the flood wall. Um, most of the archaeological resources are two to four feet below the surface. So they are protected uh, beneath the ground and uh, everything that's left of the old Portland is, is still here. The remains of the buildings, foundations, uh, sidewalks, remains of the streets, street curbing, um, old uh, outhouse pits and cisterns, and there are thousands and thousands of artifacts, the, the objects of every day that uh, people used in Portland back in the 19th century. During the early 1800s, Portland served the portage business around the falls of the Ohio. These rapids were the only navigational barrier along the Ohio River. Portland, with its deep water wharf, thrived during the golden age of steamboats. French, Irish, and German immigrants formed a strong river community. But in the late 1800s, Portland began to decline. The Portland and Louisville Canal was expanded. Large steamboats no longer had to dock at Portland's wharf. The community was also devastated by a series of floods. Ultimately, the entire port vanished behind a flood wall built to protect neighborhoods on higher ground. When we began this project, the people of Portland knew that they had a rich archaeological site. They knew that their history was buried beneath uh, this park. Um, what they did is they asked archaeologists to come in and, and uh, find out not only what condition those archaeological resources are in, uh, but how these archaeological resources might be able to benefit their community and uh, how we might be able to um, use archaeology uh, to learn more about Portland's past. Archaeologists surveyed the entire site. Park crews placed large ghost stones recovered from the old canal to mark the location of historic streets. Stotman then began to excavate the most promising sites, including lot number 56. What we found at lot 56 is uh, over six feet worth of uh, archaeological deposits and strata. So we decided to focus in on this lot, uh, thinking that we would get a really good idea of how Portland changed over time from the very beginning uh, to the very latest uh, part of the town's existence down here. The stratigraphy of lot 56 holds an intriguing story. The lowest layers are natural deposits and river silt. The next layers contain debris from the early 1800s and an odd mixture of burned materials. From court records, Stotman learned that the home of the Mangan family, French immigrants, once stood here. The Mangan house mysteriously burned to the ground in 1856, one day after it was sold. Over the next 15 years, Lot 56 remained vacant gathering dirt, trash, and debris. And then a new property owner took it over and immediately built a house. And uh, what we know, we know quite a bit about this house because we found the actual archeological remains of the house, foundations associated with the house, sidewalks, lots of artifacts associated with the construction of this building. And uh, we think that this building was very typical of the kinds of houses that were being built in Portland and Louisville during the 1870s. It was a shotgun house. This is the home of Henry and Catherine Veet, immigrants from Prussia. In the 1850s, Henry Veet established a shoemaker shop on Water Street. His family lived above the workplace in a small apartment. At that time, Portland Wharf was filled with large steamboats from southern markets. His business grew. By 1873, the Veet family had enough money to build a modest home on Lot 56. Henry Veet died in 1878 as Portland Wharf began its decline. Catherine Veet rode out three major floods until finally leaving the house in 1921. The Veet's shotgun house was one of the last remaining structures before the entire riverfront was bulldozed for construction of the flood wall. So we have archaeological deposits that we can see and artifacts from each period uh, that shows us Portland at its very beginning and Portland um, when it was at its busiest time and then Portland during its decline. So we can see the whole story of Portland seen in the archaeological layers that we have documented here at Lot 56. 
In 2007, the community of Portland celebrated a new milestone in the history of Portland Wharf. The site earned listing on the National Register of Historic Places. Officials also unveiled master plans for a unique urban park based in large part on archaeology. Archaeology in the in Portland Wharf Park is not only a way to learn more about the history of Portland and find out about the facts of the history of Portland, but it's also a way to reconnect the community with that history. That is my great-grandfather's, great-great-grandfather's farmhouse at the 40th and, uh, was it 40th and Broadway. It's an active way to get the people involved in uh, learning about their history. And this is Water Street. Mm -hmm. The curb starts right over there, and this is still some of Oh, the... isn't that something? What archaeology does is it gives them an avenue to access that past, to touch that past, and then use that past to help benefit their community today. Archaeologists have documented thousands of sites from the late 1800s in Kentucky. Each reveals a little more about the state during the Industrial Revolution. In Frankfurt, archaeologists recovered an unusual assortment of artifacts from the old state capital privy. The privy contained coins, pins, bottles, marbles, campaign buttons, spittoons, and a handgun. This collection offers a fascinating glimpse into the lives of legislators during the mid and late 1800s. In Jefferson County, the excavation of a privy vault confirmed the presence of indoor plumbing at the U.S. Marine Hospital. Opened in 1852, the hospital contained revolutionary designs for ventilation and sanitation. Today, scholars visit this National Historic Landmark to study its architecture and a century of medical service to boatmen, soldiers, and residents. And in Kenton County, archaeologist Bob Genheimer led one of the largest urban excavations ever conducted in Kentucky. Before development of Covington's riverfront, archaeologists documented a three-block area with remnants of residential and commercial buildings from the 1800s. The research uncovered dozens of intact foundations, cisterns, privies, pottery kilns, and glass ovens, all preserved when the site was buried to raise the land above river flood levels. This investigation revealed numerous details about 19th century pottery and glass industries, as well as insights into the hidden lives of factory workers. Tens of thousands of artifacts were recovered from nine privy shafts, this incredible collection gave archaeologists valuable data about local and national products and details about life in Kentucky's growing cities. With industrialization in, in Kentucky, we see a lot more urbanization, um, cities growing. And that's something that historic archaeology can really help with. We can start to look at how neighborhoods developed and how people have come in such close proximity to each other through urbanization that created by industrialization. We can see how people have, have to deal with the problems of living together and see how um, they adapted to city life. So this was new for Kentucky at this time and it laid the groundwork for what Kentucky would become in the future. Archaeology has become a powerful tool for historians, preservationists, and teachers. Each year, thousands of students and families attend public archaeology programs across the state. Through this experience, they not only learn about the science of archaeology, they also get a chance to touch the state's early history. It's much more interesting for them to learn about history in an experience like this where they're actually engaged in 
finding the artifacts and learning about other uh, cultures. They actually get to assume the role of the archaeologist and discover some objects um, that they typically wouldn't find um, or think about the objects that they find. So after they discover the artifacts, they then have to put on those thinking caps and decide, okay, what does this tell me about the people that were here before and what can we learn about previous cultures from this? Historic archaeology has become part of the modern landscape. Each new scientific discovery adds to the historic record, raises another question, and increases our understanding of the people who made Kentucky their home. The value of historical archaeology and archaeology in general is that it presents a new way to participate in the past. Archaeology has a, has a way of, of, of making the past tangible, materializing uh, that history and that heritage that we all have so that people can see it and touch it. I think one of the most basic things we can learn from historical archaeology is the past was much more complicated <laughs> than we have thought or actually that we can ever know. I think the value of historical archaeology is to provide a new and different perspective on American history through the combination of material culture and documents. The material culture is just not really utilized much by any other discipline. And if you think about your own lives, uh, how your clothing or your automobile or your house, what that communicates about your life and your values, you can see that material culture does have an important uh, contribution to make in understanding people of the past. So I think by giving us these different avenues of research, it does excite new interests, it certainly gives us new data sources, it broadens the number of folks that can participate in historical research and historical understanding, and I think these are all strong values of historical archaeology. Visit the website of the Kentucky Heritage Council for more information about the Kentucky Archaeology series, as well as educational resources for viewers, teachers, and students.